I want to welcome everyone to our monthly support group. Uh, my name is Jeanette Rodriguez. For those of you that don't know me and for those of you that do, hi again. <laughs> I'm the program coordinator with the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. Um, first off, I'd like to give uh, a thank, huge thank you to our wonderful sponsor, uh, the Riverside Medical Clinic. Um, like I said, for those of you that might have missed the beginning, um, <clears throat> we are going to be using the chat box during the presentation. Um, I'll be engaging with you there. So if there are any questions that you may have on the presentations or maybe not on the presentation, but you think you can get an answer, feel free to put that question in the chat box and I will be reading them at the very end towards our Q&A. Um, for those of you that um, might think, oh, you know, it went by too quick or like a replay of that, we will be having a replay of this uh, webinar on our website as well as our on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you do like that, I will be giving everyone my email at the very end and feel free to email me for that um, for that special link. I want to go ahead and introduce um, our special guest today. He's Dr. Stephen Speak. Um, a little bit about him, he has a very good resume, let me just say. <laughs> uh, Dr. Spinks earned his Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology and Exercise Science from Western Kentucky University and his Doctor of Physical Therapy from the University of Tennessee. Following graduation, he underwent advanced manual therapy training through the mainland Australian uh, physiotherapy seminars and received his certification in uh, orthopedic manual therapy. He has also undergone certification in dry needling through the Integrative Dry Needling Institute and Benchmark Rehab Institute. He graduated from orthopedic residency through Benchmark Rehab Institute and became board certified as an orthopedic clinical specialist. Currently, he serves as an adjunct faculty at uh, Emory and Henry College of Physical Therapy as the course director for their Doctor of Physical Therapy programs, spine-related musculoskeletal courses. And uh, he has taught across the United States as well as internationally on topics related to the vestibular system and balance disorder. So with that said, I want to go ahead and give the floor to Dr. Speaks. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, yeah, I didn't realize she was going to be reading the whole thing. Uh, I probably should have just put it in like just a few sentences uh, to make it a little less painful on your ears. Uh, all it just means is I have a, a lot of student loan debt pretty much. Um, but yeah, so my role with the American Institute of Balance, and we're actually located on uh, Eastern time zone, um, just outside of Tampa, Florida. Um, so I'm the vice president of clinical services and research. So we have a full functioning clinic for both audiology, ENT, and physical therapy. Um, so we kind of take in all that data and we've put out just, which COVID has kind of helped because I had some downtime um, for new articles just in the past few months um, on research that we've been doing um, down here at the Institute in Florida. Um, but really just my background outside of um, what she had kind of touched on is when I was in Eastern Tennessee, I worked at Patricia Neal um, Outpatient Rehab Center, which is one of the largest outside of um, Shepherd Center in Atlanta for stroke and um, brain injury rehab. And that's actually where I kind of grew my passion um, for inner ear dysfunction, which is balance and the uh, vestibular dizziness type patient population. Because even though, and we'll get into a little bit of some of the anatomy behind it, um, that patients following it, whether it's a head injury or, or a stroke, experience a myriad of symptoms. And one of those um, big symptoms is some type of generalized disequilibrium uh, or imbalance. Um, and I just want to kind of when she reached out to me and asked what kind of topic I'd like to talk about, really physical therapy and balance, because um, a lot of times it's balance is kind of pushed to the side because obviously other medical management needs to occur. Um, so this is something that I, I think is really important um, and that most individuals can really benefit from. Uh, just to go into a little bit of the statistics, um, both recent statistics coming 2019 from the CDC, uh, about every 20 minutes, uh, an older individual dies from a fall in the United States alone. That's not in, including the, um, the world. And falls are the number one cause of traumatic brain injuries. Uh, that's a huge one. And we'll get into it later because um, we'll talk a little bit about um, some what we would call intrinsic factors that are related to falls. So things that you can't really control. 
and then extrinsic factors, um, stuff at home or at work or um, wherever you're at in the community uh, that may contribute to falls. And because you'll hear a, a huge thing that is put out um, no matter where you go, what's called falls prevention. You can't really prevent a fall, but you can absolutely manage it um, with a systematic approach, um, whether it's at home or it's in a hospital or work environment. Um, the, these areas take into account all these components to kind of help reduce falls. Um, and so that's where we like to step in uh, at AIB, American Institute of Balances. Um, I like to help out with working with hospitals and community centers on some of these falls risk management programs. Um, the one thing that isn't really touched on in the statistics, unfortunately, uh, most of the stats always talk about 65 or older. Well, guess what? People who are younger fall, especially those of you, um, those of you who are younger and have had um, stroke or TBI, MTBI, um, absolutely it can put you at risk for falls for that. And what do we know? That once you've had one fall, you double your chance to fall again. Um, so just because you have taken a fall at least once, doesn't mean that you're just, you're done, you're out of it. Um, the nice thing is the research backs it significantly is that you can reduce the risk of falls. Um, and we're gonna talk about how PT, physical therapy, can help with that. And I'd love for any of y'all in the, the chat box, um, if you've had PT, if you're currently in PT and you wish to share, um, I have no problem answering and helping out as best as I can um, for that. But about 20% of individuals who do fall end up with a broken bone or a head injury. Um, unfortunately, that statistic is traditionally tied in when we talk about the broken bone um, with something around the hip, whether it's the, the, the femur or the pelvis. Um, and that in and of itself leads to other issues in the hospital. It's not traditionally the, the fall that really puts someone down. Um, it's the fact that the fall prevents them from getting up and moving. And that's where the staging of physical therapy, uh, if any of you have ever been in the hospital after a major surgery um, or some type of significant life event, you know that PT is almost there like this same day. Um, and usually people are cursing our names, uh, but it's really important to get patients up and moving, even if it's just rolling over or sitting up because um, it gets fluid out of the lungs and, because that's what usually um, is, is what is not great for patients in the hospital is because they don't move, uh, pneumonia can set in. Um, so PT, physical therapy in the hospital setting, I know people don't want us coming in day one. Um, we're absolutely beneficial at reduce, reducing um, death rates in the hospital just from immobility. Um, but what we see is that a lot of individuals um, between 27, or 2007 all the way to 2016 it, it significantly has increased. And they look at the data and they've kind of pulled out to determine, okay, well, why is this happening? Um, and it's actually a good thing, that not that part, but that most people are trying to get out, be active, be healthy. Um, so it kind of skews the data a little bit. Um, but we'll talk about how strength training, getting out, motivation, uh, is one key factor that can absolutely help uh, with the rehabilitation processes. So a lot of people say, okay, well, what can I do? Whether it's an intrinsic factor, so internalized um, or not. And these are just some components that people need to think about that may increase their risk of falls because everyone wants to be what we'll call bulletproof, um, fall proof. Um, but the, the research significantly supports the fact that lower extremity, especially so like your legs, your hip, your back, weakness can increase your chance for a fall. Same thing with foot, ankle, knee, hip pain, um, all increase the risk for falls. And then previous surgeries. Um, and many individuals, many of my patients, um, whether it's a total knee replacement, total hip replacement, outside of the inherent weakness post-surgically, um, they're just, there's what we'll call a neuromuscular change um, 
or you may hear it is called um, proprioception, knowing where they're at. Um, so after surgery, oftentimes patients don't really know exactly where their leg's at. They may say, oh, this doesn't feel like it's my own leg. Um, and that takes time and a lot of retraining to build back up that connection between the leg and the brain. So some of the intrinsic and extrinsic factors, um, and I wanna touch on a few of these, um, because obviously you can't change your age, can't change uh, your gender or your gender for that. Um, a history of previous falls absolutely can double your chance. Um, fear of falling though, and this is where PT can come in absolute handy for how PT fits in balance. Um, sometimes just having that extra individual there with the expertise and with the equipment oftentimes um, can help reduce your risk of falling, increase your motivation, increase your self-confidence and awareness. And sometimes that's all you need, um, especially when it comes to challenging yourself. Because we know that if you're only staying in a steady state, you're only gonna stay at that steady state. The only way to improve is to kind of be pushed. And PT, allows for a, a healthy push uh, in a safe manner with evidence backing it. Um, hearing impairment. So if you, um, if, if you have not had uh, your hearing assessed, having poor hearing actually can increase your risk for falls. Um, whether it's from a reaction, you don't hear something and then you inadvertently fall. Um, or if it's another type of injury to the inner ear that uh, is being masked by the hearing impairment. Obviously, mobility impairment plays a, a role in this. Low level of activity. Um, so generalized deconditioning is what you may hear it as. And that's oftentimes the, the patient's inability to lift, move, and go outside of their normal means day and day of what they're used to doing. Um, certain type of joint disorder, so arthritis. Here you'll see I have it as OA or RA, as osteoarthritis, which is just your traditional arthritis that most every individual has, including myself. And then rheumatoid arthritis. Um, where you get a little tricky are these neuromuscular disorders. So Parkinson's, Huntington's, multiple sclerosis. Um, having these doesn't necessarily say, oh, nope, we're done. We're, we're done doing balance retraining. It's not going to help us. You absolutely can. Um, and again, it, it, your physical therapist will go through the assessment and they'll kind of have a better understanding of where you're at in your level um, of rehab and kind of how they need to push you appropriately. Cognitive impairments. Um, so not just a learning disability, but inability to process information. Oftentimes, I mean, when I was at Patricia Neal, I saw this often, um, especially fo following a stroke, any type of aphasia um, from the brain and understanding, speaking, having this communication between others um, plays a role. And honestly, it's a motivation factor, not that, to say that the, the patient's not motivated, um, but having the PT around really can boost a patient's motivation. I jokingly always tell my patients is that it's 80-20. 20% of me is educating you. You're doing 80% of the work. Um, I'm just there as the cheerleader cheering you on. I mean, I'm not doing any of the hard work. The patients are always the ones doing the hard work. I just got to sit there and tell them what to do. Um, and then lastly, on the intrinsic factor um, is chronic pain. Um, on the last slide, I discussed how ankle, knee, hip pain, or chronic widespread back pain um, can, can contribute to this. And interestingly enough, a lot of the exercises that are given for ankle, hip, knee, low back pain especially, can build into balance. And so oftentimes I, I, I teach physical therapists to incorporate balance retraining into all lower extremity and upper extremity, so shoulders, arms, et cetera, um, add in some balance because when we get to some of the vestibular rehab, so inner ear rehab, we always teach that adding in a cognitive component, challenging it, 
um, whether it's through math, memorization, things that wouldn't make sense while you're doing that with exercise, really plays with the brain and makes it more challenging for the patient and honestly helps with a faster improvement. But now we're gonna get onto some stuff that you can't really control too, too much, um, depending on where you're at pharmacologically, and that's extrinsic factors. Um, so pharmacological management, you can't really say, no, I'm not gonna take this pill anymore. Um, so discussing with your, your, your care team, if you're still being seen by, by physicians, and uh, your pharmacist, they can kind of talk about drug interaction. A few things that you can work on, whether it's at home or a community center or even at work, is clutter. Decluttering is big. Um, looking at lighting, we were actually talking about this. I have a little ring light in here because if I did not, it'd be very dim in here. This, I think, is the sole lamp that I have in the living room. Um, just because it gets so hot in Florida, I've got to save some kind of electricity and keep it cooler in my apartment. Um, uneven surfaces, missing tiles, slippery surfaces. So always kind of checking your surroundings. Um, that, that plays a, a, a big role in this. And what we see oftentimes whenever I would do home visits is transition zones are huge. Oftentimes you'll go from a linoleum floor to like a, a thick carpet. Just even though it's carpet and you think it's soft, that transition in and of itself can trip up a patient. Um, Oftentimes you won't see it too much at home, but in community centers, um, poorly secured handrails, frames, or toilet seats. Um, unstable, unsecured chairs and seating arrangements, especially when you're going out in public areas where that might not be assessed all the time. Uh, improper footwear. So a, we'll call it a fad was going around. I really don't think, I haven't had any patients who've done it lately. Uh, but maybe eight years ago, my patients were using the rocker shoes. So they were rounded at the bottom and it's meant to work on core stability. And I had a lot of patients fall on those. So I usually request patients not have those. If, if, if you happen to have those in the closet, great. Don't put them on, please. Um, your, your physical therapist or whoever you're working with can give you some pretty good exercises to work on core strengthening uh, that does not involve a um, convex shoe that can increase risk for falls. One thing that a PT can absolutely help you with is a poorly adapted old or used assistive device. If it is not fitted correctly to you, especially as a single point cane, if it's not fitted right, um, that can significantly increase your chance for falls. So if any of you are using any um, assistive devices and you're unsure about the height that it needs to be at, address it with a physical therapist if you're with one. Um, if you don't have one and you're not actively seeing a physician at this time, one thing that can help, call your local PT clinic. Sometimes they'll just let you come in and they can take a, a look at kind of the assistive device you're using. A little bit about some of the hip, knee, and falls, and recent research actually that came out, I believe the end of 2019 um, and the beginning of 2020, patients with hip arthritis have a significantly higher chance of having falls risk. So I give this statistic, and it's, my statistics are never meant to induce fear because my message, especially as we go forward, is a message of hope. Um, oftentimes, patients, especially falling, um, a head injury or a stroke oftentimes kind of are down, especially when it comes to the rehab potential. But this is meant to be a message of hope. You absolutely can retrain the balance system so long as it's within um, the prognosis that's appropriate for you. So having just this history of hip OA, it may be a benefit to discuss it with your physician. Um, to address balance retraining. Even if your balance might feel okay now, um, the APTA, which is the American Physical Therapy Association, it's the, we'll call it the governing body of membership of physical therapists in the United States, has been pushing what's called prehab. 
um, we're always used to saying, oh, we're doing rehab. So you've hurt yourself. Now let's work with you. Be proactive um, and have this prehab. There's actually really good studies that are out there talking about doing prehab, so exercises, before having a total knee replacement and it decreasing the amount of time um, following their surgery that they are no longer on pain medicine, they have improved knee range of motion, and they're not in physical therapy as long. Um, which if you've ever had a knee replacement, can attest you want to get the heck out of physical therapy as soon as possible, um, especially when they're trying to bend that knee. So looking into doing prehab exercises can actually be really beneficial. And it's often not thought of when you're in the medical um, field because medicine traditionally isn't proactive, it's reactive. So I give this information as a, as a, again, a sense of hope that you, you take it and maybe you're proactive in addressing your balance um, and or just generalized strengthening, um, especially as we see the literature supporting um, the stronger you are, uh, the better your balance retraining is, the significant decreased risk of falls you have. Um, there's a, a PT saying that's going around now. It's called, you can't go wrong getting strong. And I absolutely believe, with, believe that. Um, we don't need to put you on a bench press or anything, but functional movement patterns are absolutely the way to go. Um, because again, it's functional. Just doing a bicep curl isn't very functional, um, but adding it into a lifting pattern um, can benefit you cognitively, mentally, and physically. Up to 60% of patients with any type of arthritis in their lower extremity, 60% of them had a one fall within a one year period. So taking into account your inherent risk, so take that intrinsic factor slide, assess and see kind of where you fall on that. Look at the extrinsic side, knowing that you can, within your capabilities, make some changes there. And then it comes down to the point of, if your balance feels okay, okay, maybe I should address it with my physician. I'm actually unsure if in the state of California, if you have direct access. Um, you, someone can, can pop up in the message box. So direct access means, that without a physician referral, you can go straight to physical therapy. Um, oftentimes we always think of, you need to go to your doctor, they need to write you a prescription, then you go to physical therapy for that. Um, most states have some, some form of direct access. Um, so that may be something of benefit um, once all this COVID stuff kind of calms down to, to get into that. And I'll actually talk a little bit about telehealth and how that'll be beneficial during um, COVID-19. So what are some co components of what we'll call this balancing act? Um, so we'll start on the, the left-hand side of the PowerPoint. That's the inner ear. Oftentimes you'll hear it labeled as the vestibular system. Um, this plays a massive role in integrating information about where we're at. And so if we're turning our head left, looking up, looking down, walking forward, you have a little fluid in your inner ear that's picking up on these directional changes, telling the brain, oh, hey, we're moving. And then the brain responds. And that's that middle part where it talks about brain processing. So sensory and motor integration. So sensory meaning everything we're taking in, whether it's through touching, hearing, listening. I don't know why I pointed my eye for listening. Hearing and listening, seeing everything around us. The brain translates that information and then you'll see an appropriate motor response. It puts out the information. Um, so whether we need to shift our body backwards or forwards to maintain balance, the brain is making that decision. And then our outside world, what we're seeing around us, is it bright like this uh, circular lamp I have pointing at my eyes blinding me? Or is it dark and dim? You just woke up to use the restroom and there's no lights on. Uh, and you have shag carpet, so your sense of touch is off. There's a lot of components that play into it. And oftentimes you'll hear of the balanced tripod. So that's your eyes, your inner ear, and your sense of touch. Traditionally, um, what you're standing on or how you're moving. Are you standing on linoleum floor or like I said, shag carpet or a wet floor? Um, all of those 
bring in information to the brain, the brain processes it and puts it out. Um, and that's the part of this balancing act. Um, because guess what? Not everyone has the best vision. Some people may have an inner ear dysfunction. So now you're, what this tripod is now two legs of the system and it's not three. And that's where ba uh, balance retraining and vestibular rehab come into play and can actually make you just as strong and have the same, if not better outcomes, even with one of those legs missing. So inner ear and falls. Uh, this is not meant to be an anatomy lesson, I promise you. Um, but I do want to kind of make note because a lot of people are like, okay, how do I have a, a balance issue just because I hit my head? All right, so I believe you can see my mouse moving. Uh, this is the ear. Inside we go to the middle ear. This is where you have bones that are playing a role. Um, actually, the smallest muscle in the human body is attached to this inner bone right here, the stapes, and it's called the stapedius muscle. Outside of that little um, cash cab jeopardy fact, we have the inner ear, and this is the vestibular system. If you go to the right, this is the vestibular system blown up. The spiral organ is how we hear, and these three semicircular canals really are kind of our sensation of balance and how we're moving. Um, and I put this here because having a head injury can jar this vestibular system within this encased temporal bone. So having a head injury can absolutely mess with the vestibular system and ultimately mess with um, your balance. Same thing when we talk about blood flow, especially following a stroke. Um, so here's the brain looks like a dried up walnut and then you have this little small component right here that's called your cerebellum your cerebellum so it sits in the back of the head at the base of the skull and its primary function is balance and coordination and interestingly enough we've been doing some research with um, a neuroscientist uh, close to our um, institute talking about the role of cognition in cerebellar activity um, to kind of tie in with um, patients following PTSD, coming back from war zones and having balance dysfunction purely from having psychological um, complaints. PTSD and the cerebellum might be playing a role with that. But branching off the cerebellum, you have these really small arteries. Uh oh, we've seen this before. That's your inner ear, that's the vestibular system. Um, so you have arteries coming up the back of your neck called your vertebral arteries. They connect at the basilar artery. And then that basilar artery has this little small projection called the AICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. That's all to say that if there's any blood flow restriction, any circulation issue, cardiovascular issues, can all play a ro role in decreased blood flow to the inner ear. And so if it's not getting good blood flow, it's going to send bad signals. And so decreased blood flow can increase risk for falls um, based purely on the fact that your inner ear balance system isn't functioning at the, the best way it should. I promise you that was the last bit of anatomy and physiology. I don't even like to hear it, but I actually kind of love it. So I know y'all don't, but it's always nice to kind of see why having some of these comorbidities or other issues may play a role in your balance and your, ultimately your balance rehab. So what are PTs? Who are we? Um, outside of getting a bad rap and hearing that PT stands for pain and torture, I'm not smiling because it's true. It's not. Um, we're meant, we are licensed healthcare practitioners. Um, our main mission is movement. Now, granted, we, we delve into other components in the healthcare system, but our main goal is to get patients moving, whether it's in pediatrics, neurology following a stroke, or orthopedics following an injury. The whole gambit um, under PTs is we have so much specialization. And I say that because if you have a specific issue, 
look for a, a specialist and I'll give you some resources on how to find that. Um, but especially in the area that you're at, um, there's a plethora of specialized PTs who can help you with balance. Um, but PTs are, they put together evidence-based plan of cares. And I'm going to keep talking about plan of care because that's really kind of their cookbook for how they're going to get you better. Um, it's meant to address functional impairments, not just, oh, I'm, I'm lacking range of motion and turning my head. That doesn't sound functional, but guess what? I got to turn my head to the left and to the right to back out of the driveway. Or if I'm walking uh, in a community center and I got to turn the hallway, I need to turn my head. So making it functional um, really can be beneficial for patients and make it not monotonous uh, and make it more fun. So what can you expect from a physical therapist? Um, vitals are vital. So absolutely PTs are going to be taking your vitals and seeing how you're doing currently right then and there. Um, if they're in the hospital setting, uh, they might not be doing that immediately because they're, you're having a, a nurse come into your room every two hours to assess that pretty much. Um, so outside of that, they're going to be looking at taking an extensive history, figuring out who you are. Um, and I, I make the joke, PTs often, physical therapists and occupational therapists in the rehab setting, often know you better than your primary care practitioner. And I say that because you might only see your PCP once every three months for 10 minutes at a time. When you go to PT, you're with them for about 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes two to three weeks, two to three times per week for up to three to four weeks. And it sounds like a lot, but I'm going to touch on a little bit about why we need this repetition. Um, and any of you who in the past have worked out, um, been active, you know that you, you, you're not going to get stronger just by doing one repetition once every week. It needs to be repeated over and over again um, for the brain to build a pattern, but also for the muscles to get stronger. They're going to be using an evidence-backed objective examination. There are plenty of special tests and questionnaires that PTs can use to help guide them in their clinical decision-making to make sure you're getting the best possible care that's also backed by evidence. They'll formulate their assessment of really where you're at on the rehab spectrum, and then they'll come up with their plan of care, how often they plan on seeing you, what they plan on doing with you. Is it going to be a mix of orthopedic intervention, hands-on therapy, um, and strength training, or, or where are they going to take, this, take you during this journey? So what are some of your treatment options? They've gone through, they've done their assessment with you. Now you, want to, now you want to know what are the options that they can run you through for balance rehab. Again, that's what we're, this is an isolation balance therapy. Um, so you, they may know that you just have generalized weakness and fatigue. Well, what do we know about that? The research shows weakness and fatigue can increase your falls risk. So they can put you on a strength training program, work on core exercises, which are really just kind of abdominal and low back exercises, almost working at coordination. So moving in certain ways while keeping um, your muscles active may also just be endurance style activities. The American Physical Therapy Association um, and the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapists who are specialized in stroke and brain injury rehab kind of put out guidelines um, and the importance of generalized activity throughout the day, not just strength training, but aerobic activity. That doesn't mean you need to go run, jog, or swim. Those are all great options if you're able to do them. But even just using your upper body, using your lower body in a stationary position or in moving is beneficial, both for your, your heart health, your strength training, but also your mentality. Um, aerobic exercise can decrease pain, improve mood, and actually improve the circuitry in your brain. Um, really good literature and research out there supporting that. Also, if they just find generalized poor balance, and I'm gonna separate these two out because you'll see it says poor balance and then it says vertigo and dizziness. While they may be synonymous with one another, 
they are mutually exclusive in that poor balance does not necessarily mean you have an inner ear dysfunction. It could be a muscle coordination pattern issue, um, a, a lot of components that can play a role in that. So they may just take you through traditional BRT, balance re re retraining therapy or balance rehab therapy. That can consist of stepping over objects, standing on foam or uneven surfaces, um, going through an obstacle course. I'm sure plenty of you, if you've done rehab, have had to do an obstacle course for balance. Um, those are all great because it puts you in an environment that's kind of unsafe and unsteady while they are there protecting you and giving you that motivation and support to kind of build you up. Another great one is actually Tai Chi. Tai Chi probably has some of the best research behind it for individuals who want to rebuild their balance system. Um, my suggestion is reach out to your community hospital, community centers, and see if there are group Tai Chi classes that may be a benefit to you if you're able to perform those. Tai Chi is wide body movements, slow movements um, that really actually challenge your core and challenge your center of gravity where you're at. And then the last one is vertigo slash dizziness. This is where it can get a little confusing and patients often, um, actually patients and physicians and physical therapists sometimes can interchange the words. Um, but now this is, it's this sensation of true dizziness. I, whether it's internalized movement or external world spinning, those are all things that can be addressed uh, by your physical therapist so long as some of those, what we'll call red flag um, issues have been screened out. So they've either done a CT or an MRI to make sure there's nothing, um, we'll say crazy going on in the, in the brain that might be causing the balance dysfunction or the dizziness, once those have been ruled out, uh, assessment by a physical therapist or a trained uh, neurodiagnostician like an audiologist um, can look through and assess and see what your balance function is. And their options may be vestibular rehabilitation therapy or canalith repositioning. Canalith repositioning, if anyone's ever heard of, um, I don't know if there's a raise your hand function on Zoom, but raise your hand on Zoom, or make a comment if anyone's ever heard of their crystals are out of whack or their crystals are out of place. Absolutely can happen. And think of it um, the way I teach it and talk to, to patients about it is you have um, a grapevine and you have a bunch of grapes held onto the vine. If you've ever been to a vineyard, you know, actually in California, I hope so because I would love to go to one. Um, the grapes are, hold, are held on pretty strong, but sometimes it can just take a little hit to the, the grape vine and the grapes can fall off. Same thing here, following a fall, head injury, or decreased blood flow, let's think about decreased water and nutrients to the grape vine, can all cause the grapes to drop. And those grapes, we'll say, are the crystals in the inner ear. And that can cause what's, um, you might have heard of as BPPV, benign peroxidism, paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, so those crystals falling, those grapes falling, can create this sensation of the outside world spinning, um, which a lot of people go to the ER emergency room for, and then are treated appropriately there and at physical therapy. So just some of the things that they can look at are muscle specific, endurance based, functional activities, addressing weakness or fatigue, Walking programs are really, really great. Again, it's a motivation factor. Um, it's great for your heart health, your body, um, but it's also great for your cognitive um, stability. And your physical therapist is going to give you home exercise program. It's not 20 exercises you're going to be doing at home. Traditionally, it's three to four, just to kind of carry over some of the stuff you've learned in physical therapy and to kind of keep you moving in certain patterns. Um, the general recommendation is about 150 minutes per week. So obviously you can break that up um, 20, 30 minutes for three days of moderate exercise, but at least getting two days in is really helpful. Balance retraining. Um, 
So individually, you may be given exercises to be done um, with someone with you, um, whether it's a loved one or support system um, to kind of help keep your safety while you're challenging yourself outside of the PT clinic. And again, a home exercise program is going to be uh, given to you. Or you can do group activities. I already mentioned Tai Chi. Dance classes are really great. Um, so if anyone in here knows anyone who has Parkinson's disease and um, any type of falls-related health, which automatically at a higher risk of falls with Parkinson's disease, um, dance is really good because it, it involves rhythm, which challenges a certain part of the brain, um, really boosting the rehab potential um, for reducing falls. And then lastly, looking at some of this dizzy rehab, and these are some of the articles that we put out um, just, yeah, just this year. Um, looking at BPPV, so that benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and VRT, vestibular rehab therapy. Um, again, looking at rehabbing the inner ear, not so much strengthening the lower extremities or working on balance rehab, but really working on strengthening the connection between the inner ear and the brain. Um, also remember that cerebellum that we discussed and showed. So here are some examples of vestibular rehabilitation. So in here, she's adding cognition, moving her head side to side. Some of you, if you're just doing this, you might be getting dizzy from that. Could be a number of things. Um, but if you have blurred vision, with head rotation, that could be indicative of an inner ear component. So if you're already having poor balance, you kind of feel hazy, dizzy. Um, this is also my favorite image of Rochelle. She's our vice president of marketing. And it's, no one's ever this happy when they're done with the state of the rehab, but I, I do enjoy that, that she's so happy with that. Um, another way that you can be progressed, especially for individuals who might not be able to maintain upright, um, by themselves is the use of a, a gate right, gate steady, um, a stander. Um, this is an unway system. So having the patient supported while challenging their system um, and moving their head and neck and keeping them upright. Um, so in here, she's cha being challenged by her vision because she's moving her head. She's challenging the inner ear because she's shaking her head, which again is moving those fluids in the inner ear vestibular system. And then also, she's standing on foam. Um, so that's challenging the sensory system. Now for the crystals, this is a pretty violent video. You can see her eyes moving like that. Um, she cannot control that. Um, that is coming from the crystal condition, BPPV. It's very normal for patients who have this to do it. That's because those grapes are moving in that fluid in the inner ear, and it's causing a reflex that the patient cannot control. Eventually it calms down, she feels better. But during that time when her eye was moving, the world was spinning. And actually, PTs treat this often, and it is very successful. Um, we, at the American Institute of Balance, we've created two highly backed, research-backed, um, evidence-based treatments for BPPV. Um, this is the beginning. This isn't the treatment component. This is just the assessment to see the eyes. Traditionally involves a very safe physical therapy maneuver of rolling the patient, controlling the head, um, and you're kind of playing the marble in the maze game at that point. So just a little bit of kind of summary as we go through this to give us maybe about 15, 10 minutes of uh, questions, is that there's mounting evidence and support for rehab following TBI and strokes. And it's something that I, that was my main goal coming in here was educating on the fact that there are options out there for individuals who have poor balance, but that there is hope. There really is. Um, even if you feel like your balance is off, you might not get back to where you were when you were in your 20s or 30s or where you were at two or three years ago, but you can increase your safety and decrease your risk of falls. And that's what's important and that's paramount. Um, 
because I show those unfortunate alarming statistics at the beginning, anything that you can do or your rehab team can do to reduce your risk of falls um, is absolutely paramount in your health and longevity. Um, physical rehabilitation is important to the body and to the mind. A plethora of articles are out there supporting physical rehab, strengthening endurance, and how it can improve mood, decrease um, anxiety, decrease um, depression, and improve cognition. Traditionally, a multidisciplinary approach is best. Um, so the combination of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, cognitive behavioral therapist, the whole gambit um, is usually best in the overall rehab following a stroke TBI, um, stroke or TBI, um, or just generalized um, poor balance that may have multiple levels of um, issues. During COVID-19 in this quarantine time, telehealth is a viable option. There are plenty of therapists that are out there now who have developed telehealth strategies um, to work with you and a loved one or someone who can support you um, to educate you on exercises and even do a falls risk. The nice thing about telehealth though is that you can take your, your phone around and show them what your home looks like and they can come up with a game plan on, okay, you might wanna move that rug over here, watch out for this threshold, so they can almost do an in-home assessment with you. Um, and most important, again, support and education are the foundation of your rehab journey. I always tell people the two most important things to getting better in my clinic, whether it's pain, dizziness, balance, is motivation and support. So you have motivation intrinsically and support extrinsically. So all the factors that are gonna help you get better. And one of the reasons, again, that I, I, I love what you're all doing here um, for support groups is having that support. It, it's really, it's key cognitively for you to, um, to learn from others, to learn from each other, and to kind of build this um, bond. Uh, because not everyone might share the exact same issue, but internally a, a lot of individuals um, might have the same questions or same concerns. And so having, again, the support group that you all provided is amazing. Um, there are just some resources that I have on here. Um, if, not gonna put myself out there because I don't mind helping, um, but if there are any, if any, anyone in you or know anyone who has dizziness or poor balance, whether it's following a concussion or a TBI or a stroke, um, and dizziness or balance are one of the concerns, if you go to our website at dizzy.com, you can actually look for a provider that we've trained. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but at the American Institute, Institute of Balance, we're the largest continuing education providers for physical therapists, occupational therapists, audiologists, and physicians on balance and dizziness um, and vestibular rehab. Last year, we trained 2,000 healthcare practitioners, um, went to Australia, went to... Um, the, the Middle East, we've done training all over the world to teach people how to get you better. Um, so you type in your zip code, you can find a provider that we've trained and educated um, close to you. And I think I found like 10 when I just put in the zip code that was uh, on her email. Um, you can also go through the CDC studies program, has some good patient information um, for you. Um, NACOA, so the National Council on Aging, um, ASA, the American Stroke Association, Brain Line. These are all resources that you can look at that talk about diet, sleep, some rehab, some very straightforward exercises that can be done at home. And then the place that was in East Tennessee that I worked with, uh, Patricia Neal Rehab Center. Um, also have some very good resources and educational kind of packets for patients um, following a brain injury or a stroke. Um, but so yeah, those are just some really good resources, easy resources that can um, be addressed and looked at. And so, yeah, I, I, I yield my time. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was great information. Um, I do have a couple questions for you here sure. coming in. Um, so I actually looked for um, some information if we needed a referral or not for um, a physical therapist, and we actually don't in California. So with that said, what are some specific questions that we should be asking when trying to find the, the one? 
for our physical yeah. Goals. Yeah, so when you're calling ahead, um, whether you're using our, our search tool that's free on the website or just calling around to PTs, is ask them if they have anyone there who's um, specialized in vestibular rehabilitation or balance therapy. Now, I will make mention because it is a direct access state now that you mentioned that, if you do have Medicare, you can still be seen without a referral for that one visit, and then the PT just needs to get a signature from the physician after that. But I can just tell you without going on a tangent, having that capability is huge because we've all been there, especially you see this mostly in orthopedics, is um, you fall, you hit your head, you hurt your shoulder on the weekend. Okay, well, you might go to the ER. They give you a few medicine like a pain pill or uh, anti-inflammatory. They say, go follow up with your primary doctor. You get into the primary doctor four days later. They send you to the ortho. That takes two weeks to get into. Now, by the time you get to PT, it's four, five, six weeks out, and changes in the brain have already occurred that kind of increase the risk for having chronic pain. So we really kind of push this promotion of direct access going to the front lines. PTs are trained to decide, you know what, you probably shouldn't be in my clinic. You probably need to go get an x-ray or MRI. Um, but again, it, it really can help um, push a patient and progress a patient where they're not lagging behind and suffering even longer. Um, so asking the right questions on the, the therapist there's training, and also really you, you wanna ask um, how many patients are seen by the same therapist. For balance and vestibular, you really wanna shoot for try to one to one ratio. I know plenty of people who go, who've gone to PT and it might be two other patients with the same therapist at the same time, but to have good balance rehab, the therapist needs to have their eyes on you the entire time working with them. So ask about patient volume that's in the clinic. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, another question that we have here is, are there simple exercises or practices that stroke and brain injury victims can do at home to prevent falls? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, it's actually a per, number, one of the number one predictors of falls it's called the sit to stand test. I would, I would demonstrate it for you, but of course this is how every person does. They wear a dress shirt and then gym shorts uh, bottom, uh, but it's a sit to stand test. And so having the patient do to tolerance, sitting and standing actually can really be beneficial. Making sure they're not pushing their knees back up against the chair and having someone around them, one, if they don't, having a chair in front of them that they can kind of place their hand on and work on sitting to standing. Um, also transferring, having another chair next to them, standing and transferring into the next chair if they're able to. Um, if anyone's wheelchair bound, um, there's also some other exercises that can work on core strengthening because people always think, oh, if they're in a wheelchair, they're not gonna fall. That is not accurate at all. Truncal, so core trunk stability, is a, is a predictor of falls for individuals who are wheelchair, uh, who are in wheelchairs. And so that can just be some very basic, again, having someone with you, um, working on just trunk flexion and extension and rotation if they're able to do that. Um, all can be some very straightforward exercises to be done at home. I wouldn't suggest any of the head crazy shaking because if it's not an inner ear issue, there's no reason to throw that into the mix. Um, but general standing exercises, even if you're standing at the sink and going up on your tippy toes or kicking your legs out to the side, work on strength training, but it also challenges your balance because you're in effect, if you're doing kickouts like that, you're in effect on one leg at one time, um, which challenges your balance, even if your hands are on the countertop. Perfect. And then another question that we have here, sorry, you can probably hear my dogs. Um, does water aerobic uh, help with exercise balance? Yes. So, um, and I'm going to say yes and no. Um, Water-based therapy is absolutely great. It depends, though, on the height of the water. Um, so in traditional aerobic, or sorry, not aerobic, in traditional water classes that my, individuals might be going to, there's a concept of buoyance. And so you need to know exactly, because you can displace a certain percentage of your body weight 
based on how high and where the water is at. Um, so being suspended fully in water to mid sternum isn't going to really challenge it too much. Um, the, if it's waist high water, you can, um, because you can then go on single leg stance, you can work on, um, so when I say single leg stance, I just mean on one leg, um, and you can work on twisting motions to kind of challenge you. Um, but water-based therapy should always be supplemented with land-based therapy. Um, you can get a lot of strength training in water and then maybe translate that into um, balance therapy on land. But usually, traditionally, it, it's meant to offload the joints, um, the weight of the weight or pain of joints uh, being on land. So being in water allows you to do some of the strength training exercises. That way, when you get on land, you can do some of the balance exercises. Great. Um, if you guys have any other questions, um, I have one more, but I think you've answered it relating it back to the first question that I had asked, or one of the questions mm -hmm. here. If you have a balance problem, what are the three most important things you can do to prevent falls? So if you have a balance issue, what are the three most important things you can do? Um, well, outside of getting an assessment by a physical therapist, we'll just say that's out of the question. You're not leaving home at all. Um, look at your surroundings at home, pick up loose rugs, look for transition zones, especially some older houses have like a, a six inch drop off between the living room and the kitchen. It sounds silly, but, and you're, most people hate me for saying this, but get some yellow tape, duct tape and put it there. So you at least see that because it might be dim light in the house. And so that's something you can look at move uh, all the plugs that are hanging around, whether you tape them to the ground or something else, um, get those out of the way. Um, loose blankets are another one that I've had patients trip on. I mean, I fell out of bed because my foot got stuck on the bed sheet and I was trying to get out because the fire alarm was going off. Um, so some things are just not preventable. It's just life. Um, but at least those things that are, we'll say glaring, um, that are out there. If you have this support system to help, installing rails is really beneficial, especially in the bathroom. Um, even if you haven't had surgery, one thing that can help, because um, we always talk about surgery and getting a shower chair, you might want to look at getting a shower chair. They make, um, and especially if your tub is not wide enough, they make an in and out chair. So two legs go outside the tub, two legs go inside the tub and there's no back to it. So you can sit on one side and really just scoot your bottom to where you're inside the shower. You don't have to sit on it the whole time, but it's there in case you do need to sit down and rest. Because a lot of patients, especially the ones with inner ear issues, when they're doing their hair, they're looking up and that's throwing that fluid and crystals in the inner ear and making them dizzy. And that's the number one place that people will fall. Um, so depending on medical necessity, sometimes Medicare will cover a shower chair. Outside of that, I think Walgreens CVS has them, um, but I, I couldn't tell you the price. Yeah, I think those are all the questions that I have, but I did have something um, that came to mind with yeah. uh, dim areas. Would you recommend having like little night lights in all the little outlets for them? Yes, absolutely. Um, I know at least here, go to Costco, you can get a pack of some big wall lights, three of them for $15 and it sounds like a lot, but they're the kind that you can unplug. They have a USB port. Um, they have emergency light on them. So they charge when you unplug them. Uh, but having hallway lighting um, is also beneficial. Leave the stove light. If you have a stove, leave the little stove light overhang on. Now I, I know electricity and bills can be expensive. I think it costs an extra $7 a year to leave a big overhead light on. If $7 is worth not falling, leave a light on in the middle of the night outside if you're, if you're planning on getting up. But definitely a motion detection light within your bathroom um, will be helpful. Yeah, perfect. Um, what I'm going to do for everyone that is here, if you would like a copy of this or like, like I said, it, it is recorded and I will be sharing it 
on our website as well as on our YouTube. Um, if you would like a, a, a link emailed to you directly, feel free to email me, let me know. Um, I have already entered my email into the chat box. Um, other than that, I don't see any more questions um, and we have reached our time. So I want to just thank everyone for joining us and I want to thank you Stephen for taking the time and educating us on, on balance and the importance of it and how all of our members could definitely benefit from it. I want to thank you for taking the time. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. Well, y'all, uh, if you want to, you can just go to dizzy.com. You can find my email on there. I meant to put it on there. Um, and feel free to reach out. And if there's any other topics you all would like to hear, let her know. And especially if it's related to physical therapy, I'd like to think that I can answer most of those questions. Um, I have no problem whipping up another presentation to give to y'all. Really not. Perfect. Yeah, I'm sure they would love another one. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, again, I do have his email too. So if you want a copy of the, the webinar and his email address, um, or if you want to visit Disney.com, go ahead and do that. Um, but if you want to email me, I can definitely give that to you as well. Um, and with that said, I want to wish everyone a, a good night. I know it's late for you, Stephen. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, but everyone, thank you for coming on. And um, I, I hope everyone has a great evening. All right. Well, thank you so much. And you guys have a good night. Bye, guys.